Okay, it's recording now. So in today's lecture, we will be actually continuing the semantic analysis that we started last week. And we will also be exploring uh, types and intermediate languages or intermediate language representation in this class. So without further ado, let's continue with the uh, semantic analysis that we started in the last lecture. Excuse me. <clears throat> so let's quickly recap uh, about what we have already learned. Semantic analysis ensures that the program satisfies a set of additional rules regarding the usage of programming constructs such as variables, objects, expressions, statements, etc. So some of the examples of semantic rules include uh, such as variables must be declared before being used. So the reason we do semantic analysis is to find uh, more information about the parse tree so that we can check for different types of errors. And those errors include such as a variable should not be declared multiple times in the same scope. <clears throat> It can also include that in an assignment statement, the variable and the assigned expression must have the same type. Or it can also be something like the condition of an if statement must have type Boolean. And you check all of these as part of semantic analysis of the compiler. Now, as we have already uh, also learned that uh, semantic rules can be of two categories traditionally. The first one is the semantic rules regarding types and the other one is semantic rules regarding scopes. So we have also learned about static and dynamic semantic properties and also uh, understood the differences between them. So just to recap what we have learned <clears throat> related to static and dynamic semantic properties. So static properties are those properties that can be determined by examining the text of the program without actually executing. it. Whereas dynamic properties are those properties that can only be determined by considering all the possible execution of the program itself. In some cases, we can conservatively deduce apparently dynamic properties using static techniques as well. And an example of that is symbolic execution. So uh, as you might recall that symbolic execution is a way of analyzing a program to determine what inputs cause each part of the program to execute. The key tasks for a semantic analyzer of a compiler consist of uh, finding the declaration that defines each identifier instance, uh, then determining the static types of the expressions, and after that, performing reorganization of the abstract syntax tree that were inconvenient in parser or required semantic information. And once the reorganization of the ASC is performed, then you detect the errors and fix the errors to allow further processing into the intermediate representation form. So let's look at the output for static semantic analysis. So if you can recall that the input for static semantic analysis is the uh, abstract syntax tree and the output is the annotated tree, uh, which consists of identifiers decorated with declarations and other expressions with type information. 
So the annotations are technically links or keys to a symbol table. <clears throat> the symbol table may include overt information about the scope, or it may be also about the implicit uh, information provided as part of the uh, abstract syntax tree. Now, what is a symbol table? As we have already discussed in the last lecture, a symbol table uh, consists of a lookup that can give a different result depending on from where in the program or abstract syntax tree is referenced. Uh, technically, this is done to implement uh, the desire for narrow scope declaration to override declarations in a wider scope. What does that mean? That the symbol table will have additional information, uh, additional information to the abstract syntax tree so that you can determine where, uh, the variables or part of the expression that are being used is within some certain scope or not, or what type uh, are those variables uh, as part of the abstract syntax tree. So scope and type can be determined using the symbol table, which is additional information to the AST. Now, to keep uh, in mind that uh, symbol table can also may be achieved uh, using some form of scope identifier or a hierarchy of symbol tables itself. You can also implement using stack-based symbol table, which push, which is implemented by push on declarations in a given scope and pop them uh, off when the current scope ends. Now, if I can recall last week, Matthew actually asked this question that if we can use stack-based symbol table to determine the scope. And I did mention, yes, you absolutely can, but it depends on the implementation. So as uh, uh, just to repeat the same thing that I've mentioned, you can use stack-based symbol table where you push on the declaration in a given scope and you pop those declaration uh, when the current scope ends. So you can implement by using stack-based symbol table as well. Uh, as I've mentioned that the details of the implementation depend on how the table is constructed and used. So uh, if the annotations are added during tree construction, then a stack-based approach may be more natural in that sense. But if constructed afterwards, then it might be more convenient to build a tree of symbol tables instead of a stack-based one. Uh, if it is attached to the executable for debugging, then a flat table with explicit scope context uh, might be easier when it comes to implementation. So as I've uh, mentioned earlier, depending on how you are implementing the symbol table and at which stage you are implementing it as part of the compiler, your implementation itself can vary. So do keep these in mind. <clears throat> now, something to keep in mind uh, as that uh, in statically typed languages, symbol entries for classes would contain dictionary mapping uh, attributed names to the types. What does that mean? So it has a dictionary that maps the attribute name to its type itself. So that's how symbol entries for classes are uh, like usually implemented. Now that being said, not all object-oriented languages are statically typed. For example, uh, Python, in Python, you can uh, like write classes and you can create objects based on that. Uh, so in that case, the type of the attribute of an object can cannot always be type checked from the text of the program. Because as we all know that in Python, it's dynamically typed. So, uh, you can hold different types of variable 
uh, in unlike in a variable itself. So you do not statically type the type of the variable in Python. And because it's dynamically typed, so that's not always the case that how a uh, dictionary is maintained uh, to like create a relationship between the attribute names and the, its type itself. Now, so far, uh, does everything make sense? Or is there any question? No one? Okay, I'm treating the silence as, okay, you understood everything so far. <clears throat> okay. Now, when we talk about scopes within a program and understanding like how uh, variables are defined and names and reference, uh, so we need to understand the scoping rules related to that. Let's look into that. So the scope of a declaration uh, generally means that the section of text or program execution in which the declaration applies. Now, the declarative region is the section of the text or program execution that bounds the scope of the declaration. So we'll call this as the region in short. So keep in mind that declarative region is technically the region uh, of the scope within which something is declared or valid. So if scope of a declaration defined entirely according to its position in the source text of a program, we say language is statically scoped. But if the scope of a declaration depends on what statements get executed during a particular run of a program, we say that language is dynamically scoped. So this is the basic like differentiation between statically scoped and dynamically scoped. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, in most languages, you can declare the same name multiple times if its declaration occur in different declarative regions, or it involves different kind of names. For example, in uh, like Java C++, you can use the same name for the variables, but they have to be in different declarative regions. Or if you are defining those variables in the same scope or same region, then you have to rename them as something else. Until unless you want to reuse them within that particular scope. Now, that being said, let's look into the concept of nesting when it comes to scope. Most statically scoped languages such as uh, C, C++, Java, use the algol based scope rule where multiple declaration might apply. So, which means it choose the one defined in the innermost nested declarative region. So what does that mean? So even if you declare uh, like the same uh, variable within a declarative region, you can use that only if it is nested. So nesting, within the uh, scope often expressed as the declaration, uh, inner declaration hide out the outer ones. Now, variation on this is that uh, Java, this allows attempts to hide local variables and parameter. So in Java, you can reuse the uh, local variables and parameter in other places as well. So there are exceptions and Java just uh, is one of those that allows you. So languages differ in their definition of declarative regions. 
in Java, for example, variable declarations affect uh, stops at the closing of the parenthesis, which is uh, this parenthesis, not the usual one. So this is the third bracket, if I can recall, like how it's called. Uh, so this means that each function body is a declarative region. As you know that in Java, when you define a function or a method, uh, it usually ends with this uh, ending bracket. And it means that the declarative region ends in that, uh, within that uh, scope itself. So what about other languages? In Python, function header and body make up the declarative region as does the Lambda expression as well. Uh, so there is just one X in this program, for example, let's say this is an example of the Python code. So as you can see, we are defining F as the function uh, in Python, where we pass in the parameter X and we use it by like, we store, uh, define like assign three to X and then we uh, loop it uh, till a loop through X within the range of zero to 10 and store the value in L. So here the scope is within this whole function of F in Python. So scope of X is within this whole function of uh, the Python itself. That's what it means. So the declarative region is technically this whole function for the variable X. <clears throat> now, in scoping rules, uh, one thing you need to keep in mind that whether to use uh, a variable before you declare it, right? In some cases, it can throw error. In some cases, it might not. So it depends on the languages itself that you are working with. Or if you are defining or designing your own language, you have to keep that in mind that how you will enable your programmers or community of pro developers who will be working with your language to uh, have like to follow the scoping rules. Now, languages have taken various decisions on where the scope starts. In Java C++, the scope of a member, which is the field or a method, includes the entire class, which is textually the use may precede the declaration itself. So if you define a member, which is a, a variable field or method, uh, so the scope is the whole. Uh, method itself uh, as the declaration for the declaration. But scope of a local variable starts as its declaration within that method. Now, as for non member and class declaration in C, you have to, uh, like in case, you have to use, reuse a variable somewhere else. Uh, you have to use a keyword called extern. So here, as you can see, for example, uh, you have to define that extern int f, uh, which passes, uh, like uh, takes the argument as integer. So here the function f can be used, sorry, let me get my mouse. So here the function f can be used in other places as well, but this is for C++ and the way you do it is by using the keyword called extern. <clears throat> now in Java or C++, uh, you can use the same name for more than one method. Uh, as long as the number or the types of the parameter are unique. So here, let's say, for example, 
if you have uh, the function called add, uh, you can have uh, two different method or function uh, with the same name add as well. One, as you can see, for example, this one uh, has a return type of integer, but the other one has a return type of float. That is absolutely fine to do in uh, Java or C++, but keep in mind that the way you can do it is by keeping the signature unique. And when I say the signature unique, I mean that signature of this function, you can see the past parameter or the uh, arguments are of a specific type and the return type is also of a specific type. But when you compare the integer add with the floating add function, you can see although the function names are similar, but the signature is different because the uh, passing uh, argument and the return type are different for the same name of the method. So uh, here, the declaration applies to the signature, which uh, forms the name and the argument type and not just the name itself. So the signature is considered as this whole line, which is the whole method along with the uh, passing arguments and the return type. So this is absolutely possible to be done in uh, Java and C++, but unfortunately you cannot do this in Python or C. Now that being said, when you are designing your own language, depend always think about your target user or what uh, target system your language is going to be used on. Depending on that, you have to decide whether you would allow your developers or community of programmers to this kind of flexibility of scoping or not. <clears throat> Now uh, here, another thing that you need to keep in mind that the return type uh, might not be the part of the signature, only the return type, I mean. So what it means that let's say here, you can see you have the uh, like same two different methods where uh, which is called add. So in two different method, your passing argument are uh, integer like you are passing two argument as an integer, which is same for both the function, but it is actually illegal to have two different return types and it is not allowed in Java or C++. So if uh, you have this type of thing, uh, then you can realize that uh, this is illegal in the sense because if the passing argument are the same and the name of the method itself is the same as well, you cannot have two different return type for the same type of method itself. So this is not a legal way of writing code. So you need to keep that in mind while designing your own language and compile. Uh, in a language called ADA, uh, statically typed object oriented high level programming, uh, which is uh, the language itself, it will have the return type as part of the signature. So this is one example where you can see the return type itself is part of the whole signature for the method as well. But uh, another thing is that in ADA, because of this, there is uh, also issues of the namespace that can happen. Now, let's look at the other uh, type of scoping, which is the dynamic scoping. So originally introduced in like uh, Lisp, uh, APL, Snowball, all of these, use dynamic scoping rather than static, which means it use the variable refers to most recently executed 
yet still active declaration of that variable. So it makes static determination of the declaration generally impossible. What does that mean? So let's take these examples here. So we have the main method, which calls two more methods, uh, F1 and F2. And here we have uh, defined F1 where uh, we are saying that uh, assign 10 to the integer X and then call uh, another method named G. And in F2, we have defined that uh, assign hello to the uh, uh, variable X, which is now a string, uh, call F3. Uh, so we call another method named F3 and we call uh, another like the method G. So with if we uh, write this code, so in static scoping, this is technically illegal. It's because X is used within the whole program, but the type of X are different based on which method being uh, called which is especially part of the main method, right? So with static scoping, this will be considered as illegal. But uh, when we consider dynamic scoping, this is completely legal because when dynamic scoping happens, uh, the method, the main method will execute uh, each declarative region of the method that are being called within the main method at a certain point. So uh, if we take this example, when, why in dynamic scoping, this is legal, it's because when you, uh, within the main method, when you execute the F1 function or F1 method, then uh, X will execute as an integer. But after the execution of F1 is done, and you execute F2, then the uh, type of X itself also changes because that becomes a string and it will print out hello instead. So this is an example that if we use static uh, scoping, it wouldn't work because it's not able to determine what is the type of X within the whole program. But when we consider dynamic scoping, this uh, code is completely legal. Okay, so now when it comes to uh, scopes like and declaration of variables and methods, we have two specific types uh, of declaration. One is implicit and another one is explicit. In Java C++, we require explicit declaration of things such as the uh, variables or the method that you are declaring. Now, C, on the other hand, is a bit more lenient. So if you write something like a method with a foo3, with no declaration of foo uh, in the scope, then C will supply you with one. So it could be void, it could be end. It doesn't like uh, make it uh, very, uh, how to say, strict in that sense. So in C, even if you just write the method with foo3, it will automatically assume that it's a void. Uh, in Python, implicit, uh, like implicitly declaring variables that you assign to a function is required as part of the, like declaring the local variables. So here, uh, in Python itself, you when you assign, you do not have to worry about okay what type uh, like of variable you have to define it. So you can just write in Python x equal ten. So Python will automatically uh, understood that okay the type of x in this scope is an integer. But later in a different declarative region or in the same declarative region if you store or assign a different value to X, the uh, like 
assignment type for X will also uh, change accordingly. So here, uh, that's why it's an implicit declaration uh, of variable in Python. Uh, Fortran implicitly declares any variable you use and gives them a type depending on their first letter itself. But in all these cases that we have explored, there is a declaration as far as the compiler is concerned. So whether you do implicit declaration or explicit declaration, but some form of declaration happens as part of the compilation process. Now, again, uh, the big question uh, that we are like, trying to uncover as part of semantic analysis that why do we need symbol table? Symbol table is technically, let's say, we can say it's to decorate the abstract syntax tree, which is the output from the parser or the parsing itself. Now, the idea is to recursively navigate the abstract syntax tree in effect to executing the program in simplified fashion and extracting information that isn't data dependent. And the reason we do this is because again, uh, the more information if that is added to the abstract syntax tree, it enables the compiler to determine more different types of error that the program might have. Now, the next, uh, let's say, theoretical aspect that we need to kind of learn as part of uh, semantic analysis is uh, types and type checking. So let's explore that. Though, so the main question here is why do we need uh, type checking? So type checking phase determines the type of each expression in the program, which means that each node in the abstract syntax tree that correspond to an expression, so we can uh, check the type for each of those nodes in the abstract syntax tree. So the type rules of a language define each expression's type and the types required of all expressions and sub-expressions. That's what happens as part of type checking phase. Now, a type is a set of values together with a set of operations on those values. For example, fields and methods of a Java class are meant to correspond to values and operations. Now, a language's type system specifies which operations are valid for which type. That's why we need type checking uh, also as part of the compiler so that we can check that uh, if any type checking related to errors uh, is happening in your program or not. So the goal of type checking is to ensure that operations are used with the correct types, enforcing the intended interpretation of values. Now, the notion of correctness often depends on what programmer has in mind rather than uh, what the representation would allow them to implement. Most operations are legal only for the values of some type. For example, let's say it doesn't make sense to add a function pointer and an integer in C because how would you add them? The type doesn't match, correct? Uh, or other could uh, also include that it does not make sense uh, to add to integer, especially when both have the same assembly language implementation denoted by something like this. Move L, Y, Y is an uh, integer 
percentage e x add l x again x is an integer percentage e x right so these are some of the example that type checking is very uh, useful because depending on the operation performed sometime the uh, if the type checking isn't there then the operation might not be legal at all now we have someone post something in the chat pointer arithmetic yes so uh, sorin you are absolutely correct if pointer arithmetic happens then that is absolutely acceptable but pointer arithmetic happens between two pointer not an integer and a pointer because the type miss there is a type mismatch right and that is why as part of the compilation we need the type check so depending on what kind of operation is being performed you have to perform the type check on the different fields or variables to understand whether that is legal or illegal okay does that make sense sorry <laughs> Okay, thank you for confirming. <clears throat> so again, as I have uh, mentioned already, the important part of using type checking or types is to detect errors. And that error could be memory error, such as attempting to use an integer as a pointer, or it could also include violations of abstraction boundaries such as using a private field from an outside a class so these are some of the type of errors that are uh, understood especially by using types and type check it can also help you with the compilation for example when python sees let's say x plus y its uh, type system tells it almost nothing about the type of the x and y so the code in that sense must be general but uh, if in like in python because of this uh, often time what happens you end up getting an error if the type of x and y are different you end up getting an error uh after you have uh, run like executed the python script uh so in python sense because type checking doesn't happen uh during the compilation uh so you uh, as a programmer have no way of understanding that the uh, there is a type mismatch or not whereas in c c++ the code sequences let's especially for let's say x plus y uh when you compile it already knows if there is a mismatch of the type of x and y it understands that if there is a mismatch of x and y type uh it is able to determine whether that is happening or not and tells the programmer that you have to do something about that okay now another theoretical concept that uh, you need to keep in mind it's called the subtyping so in programming language theory subtyping is a form of type polymorphism in which a subtype is a data type that is related to another data type by some notion of su su substitutability so technically uh, what does this means is that the program elements typically the subroutine or the function written to operate on elements of the super type uh, that can also operate on the elements of that sub type let's take this example right so if you have let's say the class of bird in uh, java let's say so bird is a generic let's say superclass but 
you can also have specific classes which are technically duck, cuckoo, or ostrich. All these three are uh, birds as well. So they inherit the property of the bird and like duck, cuckoo, or ostrich are technically the uh, subtype of the supertype, which is bird itself. So conceptually, each of these, uh, the uh, duck, cuckoo, and ostrich uh, is a variety of the basic type bird, which is a uh, supertype that inherits many bird characteristics, but has some specific differences among each other. I'm very sure that uh, since you are already working on Java and um, you must have already learned object-oriented programming, so you know how inheritance work among classes. So when you work on that, subtyping is a feature in the programming language itself. Now, you can have different type of typing options as well. Uh, especially there are three types. One is statically typed, dynamically typed, and untyped. So in statically typed, almost all type checking occurs at compilation time. For example, uh, C in C and Java. So static type system is typically very rich uh, and can be further subdivided into weak statically type or strong statically type. On the other hand, we have dynamically typed, which is almost all type checking uh, occurs at program execution level. For example, Scheme, Python, JavaScript, Ruby, these are all examples of dynamically typed languages. Uh, in this case, static type system can be trivial, like when it comes to dynamically typed uh, languages. And the third type of, that you have is the untyped, where no type checking happens. So what we might think of as type error show up either as weird result or various runtime exceptions. Now, uh, an example, of untyped could be assembly or an assembler itself. Now, let's talk about type wars. What does that mean? That uh, dynamic typing, it uh, usually says that like when it comes to dynamic typing languages, they, considered that static type systems are very restrictive uh, and can require more work to do than reasonable. Uh, dynamic type languages also consider that rapid prototyping is easier in dynamic type system comparative to the static type system. So in dynamic uh, type system, like type languages, uh, you can use duck typing, which is it defines the type of things by what operations they respond to. So if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. That's the theory behind duck typing. Now, comparatively, static typing kind of accuses of like uh, dynamic typing in different way. So static typing languages, they claim that uh, static checking catches many programming error at compile time, thus avoiding uh, a lot of errors that could not be understood or found when it comes to dynamic typing. Uh, static typing also avoids overhead of runtime type checks. Uh, in static typing, you can also use various devices to recover the flexibility lost by going just static, which means like uh, you can do subtyping, coercions, and type parameterizations. So of course, each such like wrinkle introduces its own complication when it comes to static type languaging. 
note that in weak static type, uh, st static typing, uh, it has some of the features of dynamic typing whilst being safer. And by being safer, it means that it is able to catch more error comparative to the uh, dynamic typing. But technically, weak static typing is very close to or uh, has uh, some similar features as the dynamic typing itself. Now, in languages such as Java, it can define types or like classes either to implement a type or define the operation on a family of types without completely implementing them. Hence, this relaxes static typing a bit. So we may know that something is a Y without knowing precisely which subtype it is. Now, we also have something called implicit coercions. So let's look at that. Like in Java, we can write something like int x equal c within quotes. And uh, we can also say that float y equals x, right? But the relationship between character and integer and or uh, float are not usually called subtyping, but rather conversion or coercion. So in this case, such implicit conversion or coercion can avoid cumbersome casting operation. So the flexibility uh, that Java provides in this case is that you can assign characters to integer variable. Uh, what it does, you do not have to uh, like explicitly do casting on the, uh, let's say character C, so that it could be hold in or assigned to the variable X, which is of type int. This is in theoretical perspective called the conversion or coercion. Now, if the language that you are designing if it allows you, like if your programmers or developer, community of developer, do need such a feature, then you are capable of uh, using this as part of your language. Now, keep in mind that uh, this often implementing coercion or conversion might change the value or representation of the variable. But usually such coercions allow implicitly only. If the type coerced to contain all the values of that type from a widening coercion or conversion itself. Now, uh, inverses of widening coercion which typically lose information, such as when you convert from integer to character. This is known as narrowing coercion or narrowing uh, conversion. And typically requires to be more explicit in nature. Uh, you can also have uh, integer to float uh, conversion, which is uh, traditionally an exception because here it's implicit. But you can lose information, especially let's say when you're converting uh, like uh, integer to float, there ca can uh, be some uh, information which is lost when this type of portion is being performed. Let's look at some coercion examples, right? So here, as you can see, you have an object. You can like assign it some value. You have a string, y. Uh, you are assigning that some value. As you can see here in this line, so we are uh, assigning the uh, value of x to the y. Now, if you can recall from the above lines, uh, x is an object, y is a string. So 
when we try to assign the x to y, uh, you can see that this is actually leading to widening error because the type of object, the value that is being stored might not be able to be stored in the uh, string y. And there could be loss of information. So what will happen in this case, uh, your program should throw the widening error. I'm so sorry. Can you give me one second? Uh, I think, uh, sorry. And the recording is resumed. So uh, here, as you can see that the possibility of implicit coercion can complicate the type matching rules, especially if consider that this uh, example is coded in C++. So in that case, definitely uh, you're in C++, it will throw errors because there is type mismatching, especially as you can see here, which is the widening error. We are trying to store uh, the value of an object into a string. So in C++, it might be an error, but in some other language, it might not be an error, depending of how the language is defined and where such a language is being used. Now, type inference, like how you can infer the type, right? So it means that the types of expressions and parameter need not be explicit to have static typing. Uh, with the right rules, uh, you might infer their type itself. Now, the appropriate formalism for type checking is the logical rules of inference having the form of such as if hypothesis is true, then conclusion is true. Now, for type checking, this might actually become something like if E1 and E2 have certain types, then E3 has a certain type as well. So if we can recall, as I've mentioned, the uh, duck typing, where if something uh, seems like a duck, walks like a duck, it is a duck. It's here, we are using the same notion that for type checking, if E1 and E2 have a certain type, then E3 has a certain type as well. Now, Given the proper notion, it's easy to read uh, with practice. Uh, so it's also easy to check that the rules are accurate or not. And it can also be mechanically translated into programs as well. What does that mean? Depending on the rules of the type inference, you can mechanically translate that into programs. Now, <clears throat> some other issues that might occur uh, when it comes to uh, type inference and type checking, that there are also control flow errors. What does that mean? Is that uh, you must verify that a break or continue statement is always enclosed within a while or, or for statement. So these are control flow errors, which is not uh, like uh, uh, type checking errors. And control flow errors are also another type of errors that is part of the semantic check itself. Uh, another example, like in Java, uh, you must verify that a break X statement is enclosed by a for loop with the label X. Now, you can easily check control flow error by recursively traversing the abstract syntax tree. So, if you can recall earlier here, 
uh, I have mentioned that if you know the rules, then you can translate that mechanically into program. Now, that being said, you can actually use the natural deduction to deduce the type as well. So what we mean by that, that we can actually uh, define or write it something using this symbol, uh, which means that, okay, exclamation, uh, then you have this symbol and then the pound sign. This actually means that A proves B indicating that B can be derived from A using some correct rules of reason. Now, right now, if it's a bit confusing, don't worry, I will show with example what this actually does or what this actually means, right? But just bear with me uh, for now uh, to understand the theoretical uh, background of natural deduction to deduce type. So here, as I have mentioned, uh, like exclamation sign and then followed by this symbol and then pound sign, uh, this means that we can find a derivation from A to B through a sequence of logical steps. Then the statement, which is exclamation and this sign and B itself is true. Now, this can be seen as the rule that is provided. So this is called the natural deduction rule. Okay, for some reason, this is overlapping. I'm not sure why. Give me one second. It wasn't the case before. Okay, for some reason, today things are uh, during the lecture are not going as planned. Okay. This might be, uh, okay. So when it comes to natural deduction rules, you need to keep uh, two kind of rules in mind. The one that tells you that uh, how to reason uh, sentential form with connectiveness and how to deduce a compound sentence with a given connectiveness. So it's better that we take examples to look into this. So what we can see here, you can see that, uh, let's say you have a set A of sentences, which is called antecedents, and you have B, which is called the conclusion. So if we write something like you will see here on the screen, it has a bunch of symbols uh, and on top and on the bottom, you have again, bunch of symbols. What does that mean here? The top top uh, of the, let's say, uh, if we consider this as a fraction sign. So the uh, numerator, which is a top sign here, we call that as the antecedents. And from there, using, using the antecedents, we deduce the conclusion, which is provided in the denominator side. So antecedents basically means something that has gone before a prior and we can write that as also something like, again, in the, this notation. Now I know this is very confusing, but uh, what we will do, we will show you uh, by using an example shortly. But before I show you that example, that uh, how to use uh, natural deduction, let's also define another thing that is called an environment. We 
often express our logical steps, uh, which is the deduction rules within the context of an environment. Uh, the environment, which is also represented by the gamma, uh, is the context in which the variables are declared, which basically means that within the environment, that is within the program, these rules governs, then a series of rules will be presented that are applicable in the context at hand. So this is a theoretical background of what is an environment. Technically that in practice, that is the program itself. Let's look at natural deduction with an example. So it will clear up all the symbols that we have seen earlier, which doesn't make much sense. But when you take an example, now it will make a bit more sense. So the example here that we are taking that first of all, remember, let's denote the environment as this symbol, right? And you are given four rules, deduction rules. The rule A is that uh, your environment consists of integer, which is uh, itself a type of int. Rule B is that if you have a variable V, which is of a type integer, it itself deduces the uh, variable V itself. And given these two rules, you can notice another pattern that the uh, third rule, which is C uh, rule that is provided, is that uh, if you have two variables, which is E1 and E2, and are of the type integer, both of them, then you can perform the uh, addition between these two uh, like variable E1 and E2, which will also return the type int or integer. Uh, you have the fourth rule, which says that if you have E1, E2 as the variable, uh, which is of type integer, then you can also perform uh, subtraction, uh, which is E1 minus E2, and that will also have a return type integer. So imagine within the variable, uh, sorry, within the environment, which is this one, we are defining these rules, and these rules could be used to understand whether, uh, an expression can be computed or not. Now, what does uh, what do I mean by that? So depending on these rules, that four rules that are provided, uh, if you are asked that an expression is uh, provided to you such as a plus three minus b. So how can we deduce a plus three minus b expression using these four set of rules? Let's look at that. So uh, here, remember, let's start from the left-hand side, right? So we are taking A plus three. So what we are doing, A itself is a variable. So let's see which rule can uh, like uh, be used for A. Since A is a variable, we can actually use this rule because as you can see, V, which is a variable, is a type of integer can be deduced to V, which is integer. So this is the rule. We can apply this one to A. So we can apply the rule B to A. And now uh, the next uh, in this expression is three. Now let's see among these four rules, which closely relate to three. Three, here you can see that uh, there is a rule a, which is in int is uh, deduced as integer. So we can use this rule A for uh, three itself. And for B, because again, B is again a variable V, which is of a type integer, we can use the rule B to define the uh, B variable in the expression itself. So using that, as you can see, how we have uh, defined. So here, uh, A 
is using like a is technically an integer using the rule b which is this rule b uh, three is an integer as well but because it is an integer and not a variable we are using the rule a which is defined by this and again b is an integer which is using the rule uh, b from here oops sorry uh, b from here now if we have to uh, do the addition between a plus three from the rule, we can see that the rule for addition is actually defined in the uh, uh, rule C. So that's how we are using the rule C here. And finally, after we have uh, got the answer from here, we have to uh, do minus B, right? So minus B, as we can see, rule D uh, defines how minus B can be achieved. And that's why we use the rule D to uh, like finally reach the conclusion. So using these four set of rules, we show that we can deduce the type of the expression for this particular A plus three minus B. By the way, so far, the, did it make sense? Especially like using the example that how we can deduce type uh, from set of deduction rules. Okay, sorry. Uh, the example, yes, the notation, no. Uh, actually, you are absolutely right. So example, uh, we can imagine this technically uh, in theory, these notation, right? So this one technically means the environment and the environment in practical sense, it means it's the program itself within which it's running. So let's say if you wrote a program, which is the expression analyzer program, remember? So if you put the input as A plus three minus B, right? So the environment uh, is the program. Uh, that where you are providing a plus three minus b as the input. But in theoretical sense, you have to uh, denote it in some way. So computer scientists and mathematicians, they denoted, okay, if we have to uh, define uh, the environment in mathematical terms uh, to deduce the type, then we will define it by this notation. So uh, these notation that you can see, like this notation technically means it deduces. Like uh, in the environment, which is on the right, uh, left-hand side, uh, it deduces uh, the integer, which is on the right-hand side. So this is just a notation that let's say a mathematician and compute, theoretical computer scientists use to define deduction rule so that you can deduce type from expressions. So there's technically nothing uh, more to be like uh, revealed from here than to just memorize that how these notations are written. But the most important thing that we need to keep in mind is that using this notation, you can define different rules. As you can see, for example, here, we have four different rules, right? We have the rule of integer, which is the integer number itself. We have integer variable, rule for integer variable. We have the rule uh, for summation, which is in the rule C. And we have the rule for uh, subtraction, which is the rule D. So if you are given, these rules, the ultimate, let's say, practical goal is whether you can deduce the type of the uh, expression, which is a plus three minus b. It could be something more complicated as well than this expression. But using these rules, you can actually determine what is the conclusion or conclusive type of the whole expression. In this case, it will be an integer. 
which I have shown using the breakdown uh, here. So did it make sense? So when it comes to those notation, that is something technically just remembered that you have to memorize. So did it make sense, Soren? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's take a five minute break before we uh, progress with the rest of the lecture. Okay, and we will resume in five minutes. Just let me pause the video recording in the meantime. Okay, cool. Uh, by the way, can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you, Curtis. Perfect. So uh, earlier in our labs, we have actually explored how we can use visitor, right? And you have been using that as part of your lab uh, itself and assignments as well. Right now, we are going to look at an example of using listener. So uh, the like, uh, as you already know that the antler, when you generate the files, antler provides you two different way of parsing the nodes, right? Uh, one is the listener, like listener class. Another one is the visitor class. Now, here with a small program, we are going to see how listener can be used to calculate or evaluate simple, simple arithmetic expression using stack. Now, uh, we actually need to create uh, and extend the base listener. So. In the labs, you will see the example is already provided for arithmetic expression. Once you generate the uh, classes using Antler library, you will be able to see that there is a class called base listener and you need to ex extend that. So base listener uh, provides you uh, two methods for each component of the expression. Uh, the two method will be something like enter and exit. So if you have uh, the uh, expression, uh, like expression grammar, which has the uh, production rule called start. So for the production rule start, you will get two methods. One is enter and another one is exit. What it does, uh, so using the listener, the listener class automatically visits each node of the parse tree. So uh, using the method called enter and then it exits the node using the method called exit. So if you have this grammar, technically it's a basic like expression analyzer grammar where you can do a multiplication or addition, right? Of expression. So this is the grammar for that. Uh, expression analyzer. If you are given this expression analyzer, then <clears throat> you can extend the base listener as an evaluator where you uh, on, so you extend the exit method for the int, uh, which is here, as you can see. So int is the, uh, the terminal where it's saying that uh, int is basically anything which is a number from zero to nine and more, right? So the code to evaluate uh, using listener, evaluate expressions using a listener is this one, as you can like uh, see. So you can like later uh, revisit the lecture on Moodle pause, or you can also uh, like look into the slides for the lecture 
and you can try to implement this yourself to see how you can use a stack and uh, stack and the listener to evaluate expressions using the grammar provider. And this is the code for the uh, exit method for multiplication. So again, we are using the stack method uh, and the listener of Antler to evaluate the multiplication of expression analyzer. And this one is the code for the addition side of it. So do try this out on your own time. Um, like the code is already provided to you in the uh, slides as well as later on Moodle when I put up the lecture, you can also pause the video and able to replicate the uh, code itself to try it out yourself. Now, the reason why I uh, like shown you this is because this is, remember, as part of the parsing, uh, we basically, the output is the parse tree, right? Now the parse tree itself, or which can also be extended to abstract syntax tree, which you have already done as part of assignment one, and now you should also be implementing that as part of assignment two. Oftentimes, the uh, abstracts in, like uh, from the parse tree, you generate the abstract syntax tree, and abstract syntax tree itself could be considered as the intermediate representation, which is later again processed by the backend of the compiler. So, that being said, <clears throat> let's look at intermediate languages. So, from the parse tree or uh, the abstract syntax tree, we could produce machine languages directly. However, it is often convenient to first generate some kind of intermediate language. Intermediate language, uh, simply said, it could be thought as a high level machine language for a virtual machine. And uh, sometimes uh, intermediate language can also be called as intermediate representation or in short, intermediate language is called IL or IR because again, it can be called as intermediate representation as well. So what are the advantages of intermediate languages, right? So it separates problem of extracting the operational meaning which is the dynamic semantics of a program from the problem of producing good machine code from it. Now, uh, it also gives a clean target for code generation from the abstract syntax tree. Now, by choosing intermediate language or intermediate representation judiciously, we can make the conversion of IL to machine language easier than the direct conversion of uh, abstract syntax tree to machine language. Now, remember, in the as part of the parsing and semantic analysis, especially in semantic analysis, what we have seen that abstract syntax tree come with uh, additional information, which is stored as part of the symbolic uh, symbol table, right? So that is used for type checking or errors. So <clears throat> there, uh, if you are only given the abstract syntax tree and not given the, let's say, symbol table, oftentimes it is very difficult to convert the AST directly to machine language. That's why the in, in between we have that uh, process, which is semantic analysis, which adds the additional information as symbol table to the AST, using which you actually convert the AST to intermediate language or intermediate representation. And from the IL, you convert that to the machine language itself. So uh, the reason it is, it is like this process is maintained is because 
it's helpful for different type of target uh, architectures or target systems. For example, in C, you can use GCC compiler, which actually does all this uh, on its own. Now, likewise, if we can use the same intermediate language for multiple languages, we can actually try to reuse the intermediate language to convert it to machine language implementation. So for example, uh, GCC or CIL, which is the Microsoft Common Language Interface, uh, you can actually use them uh, to convert, the to generate the intermediate language and also to convert to machine, uh, machine language itself. Now, abstract industry can be thought of a high level language independent intermediate uh, language or intermediate representation. The tree node structure uh, of the abstract industry is a form of a language uh, as expression nodes and statement nodes common to many languages. What does that mean? Why? So, let's uh, revisit that why we call abstract syntax tree as a high level IR or IELTS. If you can recall, abstract syntax tree is technically a tree consisting of node. And the node uh, are basically representing the expression nodes or the statement nodes. Now expression nodes and statement nodes are commonly used in majority or many languages, programming languages these days. That's why abstract syntax tree can be thought as a high level IR or IL. Let's take example of expression nodes, right? So you have integers and program variables. For example, you can also have binary operations such as if you have E1, uh, operator E2, so E1 and E2 are variables and uh, an operation is performed. So if you have like uh, arithmetic operation or logical operation or comparison, comparison operation, right? Those are binary operations, right? And these are all examples of expression nodes, which can be easily represented using abstract syntax tree. You can also have unary operations as well, which is represented by operator and E, which is the variable E. Uh, one practical example could be not E itself, like the exclamation sign E, where you're saying if uh, that is not true, right? That is an example of unary operation. Another example could be uh, of expression node is array access. So you have E1, which is a variable, uh, it's an array variable uh, consisting of E2, right, arrays. So these are all examples of expression node which can be represented as part of AST. And these are commonly used in majority of the languages today. This is an example of, let's say, these are the example of statement nodes that could be represented as part of the abstract syntax tree. You can have block statement, such as uh, statement sequences like S1, S2, SN, so on, right? Those are block statement. Uh, so you can also have example where you have variable assignment. So you assign E variable like value to the variable V here. So these are some of the uh, example that of statement nodes that again could be represented using the abstract syntax tree. The reason I'm showing these examples is because you need to keep in mind that abstract syntax tree itself is a very powerful uh, tool. Uh, that could be used at par as part of the compilation process itself. 
because AST or abstract syntax tree itself could be thought as a high level intermediate language or high level intermediate representation. <clears throat> now, apart from uh, uh, expression node and statement node, you can also have other form of constructs as well. Let's say, for example, you have uh, for loops, or you can also have break and continue statement, or you can also have switch statement. These can also be represented through abstract syntax tree. Now, abstract syntax tree is uh, more uh, seen as a high level intermediate representation. Let's look at low level uh, intermediate representation, which is the next part of the compilation process, because that is uh, like one of the key component of converting to machine level code. So low level in, uh, representation, intermediate representation is essentially an instruction set for an abstract machine. So alternatives for low level IR includes uh, three address code, or quadruples, they are also called quadruples, which you will find in the dragon book of your, which is the main textbook of your. Uh, technically, the reason it's called three address code because it has like always uh, three addresses that are being used for the statement. So here you can see A, B, C, these are all addresses that can be used for the statement. Now we will explore three address code uh, in more detail, uh, like in the next lecture. But for now, just let's keep this in mind that one of the uh, form of like low level intermediate representation is three address code. Other example can also include tree, tree representation, which you will find in your tiger book. Uh, and another uh, uh, example is stack machine. For example, uh, the Java bytecode is implemented using stack machine. So the low level intermediate representation is actually uh, in Java bytecode is represented uh, using the concept called stack machine. Now, let's look into stack machine as part of the virtual machine, which is heavily used or commonly used in Java. So a stack machine is a mode of computation where executive control is maintained wholly through append, read off, and truncation of a first in last out uh, memory buffer known as a stack, requiring very few process registers. So one of the key advantages of stack machine is that it requires very few registers, processing registers. And the way it is performed or implemented is that you have append, read off, and truncation, where append technically means it does a push operation and truncation technically means it does a pop operation. So, it is uh, the stack machine is a simple evaluation model uh, where it instead of registered a stack of values for intermediate results are used. Example, as I've already mentioned, like Java virtual machine uses stack machine. Uh, the PostScript interpreter also uses a uh, stack machine as well. <clears throat> now, the operations uh, that uh, makes up the stack machine, it consists of, uh, it does pops, it's operand from the top of the stack, then it computes the required operation on them, and then it pushes the result on the stack. These are the basic operations of the stack machine itself. So let's take this example, right? If you have to compute seven plus five using a stack machine, how will that be achieved? 
the way you do it first you do push seven which technically means that you are pushing the constant seven on the stack then you do push five which again means you are pushing the constant five on the stack and then you do a pop by doing add and by a pop here what you are doing you are adding five and seven from the stack and then you're pushing the result back onto the stack. So this is an example of how you can use a stack machine to compute seven plus five. Now, what are the advantages of stack-based uh, intermediate representation? You remember you can also have tree or uh, you can also have three address code, right? But for now, Let's look into why stack uh, machine uh, as intermediate representation could be more advantageous in some cases. The advantages are that you can do uniform compilation scale, which means that each operation takes operands from the same place and puts results in the same place. This actually leads to uniform uh, compilation scheme uh, and hence, it, it is a simpler compi compiler in essence. Now, the location of the operands is implicit in nature, which means that uh, always on top of the stack. And you do not need to specify the location of the result. Add instruction is just add rather than add R1, R2, which is, as you can see, as you can remember that in stack machine it requires less registers right so we do not need uh, like uh, to perform or specify uh, registers itself when you just do add in stack machine it automatically knows the previous push that has been done you need to perform the add on those push operations so in this way we can save a lot of register processor register implementation when it comes to stack based intermediate languages or intermediate representation. Now, uh, also in stack based intermediate uh, representation, you have fewer explicit operate, operands in instructions, which means that smaller encoding of instruction and more compact uh, languages or more compact programs. Hence, uh, it is used in Java bytecode and CLR, which is a common language runtime of Microsoft. Uh, and stack-based uh, intermediate language also meshes up nicely with subroutine calling, which is like a convention that uses push argument on the stack. So these are some of the advantages of using stack-based intermediate language or intermediate representation. Now, we can actually also implement stack machine using accumulator. Now, accumulator in computers is a special type of register. As you have seen, in stack machine, you might not require a lot of registers, but you can use special register named accumulator to achieve or implement stack machine as well. So how to do that? The add instruction, let's say for that uh, example that we have seen seven plus five, where you're doing addition operation, right? The add instruction in the stack machine with accumulator performs three memory operations, which consist of two reads and one write of the stack. The top of the stack is very frequently accessed. So the idea behind this is that you keep most recently computed value in a register, which is called the accumulator, since register access is actually fast or faster than other type of memory access because it's uh, registers are uh, technically implemented directly on the uh, processors itself. Excuse me. <clears throat> so let's take an example uh, using like stack machine with accumulator. 
So for an operation, if you if you are uh, told that you have to perform the operation on the variables, let's say E1, E2 till EN, right? So what you need to do, you need to compute each of E1, E2 till EN plus one into the accumulator and then push that on the stack. Uh, uh, then you have to compute EN into the accumulator. Uh, after that, you have to perform the operation uh, or the op computation with the result in the accumulator. And after this is performed, then you pop E1, E2 till E9 of the stack. So this is, these are the steps that you need to perform in order to do uh, operation or in or of variables uh, E1 to EN on a stack machine with accumulator. Now, uh, by the way, does it make sense so far? Everyone, any question? No? Okay, I'm taking the silence as uh, so far so good. Okay, uh, Curtis, you mentioned would like to see an example. Absolutely. Here is an example of stack machine with an accumulator. Let's see how we are going to perform that, right? So let's say you have to uh, do an add uh, of instruction, which is shown like this. So what you do, if you have to add using stack machine with accumulator, what you are doing, you are getting the value from the accumulator. Then you are adding it on the, uh, from the top of the stack, the value achieved from the top of the stack. And then you are storing that back to the accumulator. And then uh, you pop one item of the stack and you keep on doing that till you have done addition for all the variables in this stack. So, uh, this one uses just one memory operation to perform that, which is popping just means adding constant to the stack pointer register. So after computing an expression, the stack is as it was before, computing the operands. Did someone post something, by the way? Okay. No one asked anything. Uh, Curtis, did this make sense? The example. <clears throat> okay, thank you for confirming. Although, uh, okay, uh, is there anything specific you would like to ask? Okay, cool. Thank you for confirming, Curtis. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Let's look at another example, right? This is now not the, the like in the previous example, this was more on the theoretical side, right? Where we are saying, okay, you take the value from the top of the stack, you add it, put it in the accumulator, and then you pop one item from the stack and you continue doing that. Now that's the Example, like exemplar theory, right? Let's look with a definitive example, which is we have to compute seven plus five using a stack machine with accumulator. How you are going to do that? So what do you do? You store the value seven in the accumulator. Then you push uh, the value of accumulator. Then you store the value of five in the accumulator. And uh, here, you do uh, you have perform the addition uh, with the accumulator on top of the stack and then you pop the stack itself and finally it will show you the result which will be uh, 12 stored in the accumulator okay this is a bigger example where instead of doing just seven plus five, we are also adding three. 
So three plus seven plus five. As you can see, we are storing the value of three in the accumulator. Then we are performing the push uh, accumulator operation. Uh, then we are storing the value of seven in the accumulator. We are doing the push uh, per, uh, op operation on the accumulator. And we are storing the value five in the accumulator. After we have uh, done this, like after we have stored the value of five in the accumulator, then what we do, we uh, perform the addition operation uh, from the stack, top of the stack on the accumulator and we pop it. And we do that twice because there is two addition operation. That's why we have to do the pop twice. And we finally uh, reach the uh, value or the valuation, which is 15. Now, we have looked into the intermediate representation, the low level intermediate representation, which is the uh, stack machine. And we have also uh, covered that how stack machine could also be implemented using accumulator. But in theoretical perspective, we have a concept called reverse Polish, which is basically used to denote or uh, represent uh, intermediate uh, languages or low level intermediate representation uh, in this reverse Polish form. Now, how to perform this reverse Polish form? It's actually very simple. All you do, in reverse Polish is that the operator follows the operand. This is the only rule that you have to keep in mind. Again, uh, also keep in mind that reverse Polish is a theoretical like representation of any expression, especially in intermediate language or intermediate representation, right? So let's look for example, uh, what it actually means. As I have mentioned, the operator follows the operand. So if you have two plus three, and if someone asks you, okay, can you write the reverse Polish? Then it would, uh, how you would write the reverse Polish representation of two plus three is two followed by three, followed by the operator, which is the plus. So your reverse Polish simply looks like this, right? Now, Let's make it a bit more complicated. Instead of uh, two operands, you have three operands, which is let's say three, two, and one. So if you are given the expression three plus two minus one and asked uh, to kind of uh, provide or write the reverse Polish of that, as you can see, remember the operator follows the operand rule, right? So, sorry, here, uh, three and two will go first. And then after that, plus will follow. And then because minus one is done. So after that, one will follow and one will be followed by minus. Okay. So does it make sense so far? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Curtis, for confirming. Thank you, Dragos, for confirming. <coughs> okay, so as you can see, like first two is added to three and then one is subtracted from it. That's why we have represented uh, in re reverse Polish in this way, where three added to like uh, two is this part and then one is subtracted from it. Another example, let's say uh, a bit more complicated one, which is if you have three plus two star one. So this will mean actually you need to perform two star one, which is the multiplication first, then you can add, right? So this is based on the rule of precedence. So if you're given this, uh, this example of an expression and you are asked to create reverse Polish, then the, uh, again, Always keep in mind that precedence is always followed in reverse Polish as well. So your expression will look something like 
what you do two plus uh, uh, like two a star one will be done first and then three needs to be added and uh, you finally arrive to the reverse polish uh, representation in this way uh, another ex uh, different example if you are given three plus two within bracket star one here it's already mentioned that three plus two needs to be performed first and then it needs to be uh, multiplied with one so the reverse polish in this sense will actually look something like three two uh, plus and then you perform the one star which is the multiplication with one so consequently as you can observe in reverse polish uh, there is no need for parentheses in general because you do kind of end up following precedence anyway. <clears throat> now, this is a code example. So remember in the lab, we have already tried pretty print, right? But you can actually update the pretty print visitor to even print reverse Polish. And this is the code example that is uh, given in your slide or even later in your lecture when it uh, goes live on Moodle. You can use this code to convert your pretty print into a reverse Polish printer. So you can also try out this code on your own time to print out reverse Polish representation uh, instead of pretty print. This is again the, so, <clears throat> excuse me, this one is the code for the uh, multiplicative visitor class. And this one is the code for the additive visitor class, uh, which you can use to do like print out in reverse Polish uh, representation. Again, this is a continuation of the code that you can uh, use to uh, convert the pretty print into reverse Polish representation using the visited class. Now, that being said, we have reached uh, the end of today's lecture. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, thank you for confirming, Curtis. So the as soon as the lecture recording is provided, uh, I will make it available on Moodle. So you can again go through uh, the lecture uh, on your own time and do the reading on your own as well to get a more in-depth understanding of the concept that we have uh, explored. But that being said, let me... Uh, Pause the recording.